Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We have one of the OGs of guests back with us, Stephen Shattuck. It's been too long. <laughs> oh my God. So we talk, Jert and I talk all the time, like one of our favorite things that ever happened was we had you on and you showed up with a handmade set of like high tech goggles that you made um, because you had written this fabulous book that I still refer to all the time, <laughs> Robots Make Bad Fundraisers. And um, I should have gotten it out of my office and brought it into the studio. I, That's okay. <laughs> I forgot. It's a fabulous book. It's a great lesson on how to um, fundraise and what it looks like from a, the other side of the table. And I can't recommend it enough. I think it's it's really a super oh, thanks. Cool. No, it's a super cool piece of work. I really, really love it. But today we have Stephen Beck on the nonprofit show to talk about capital campaigns. And this is going to be really an interesting conversation because he's giving us some uh, new research that has been done. And so we're going to really delve into this to understand what what's cooking. If we haven't met, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd and CEO of the Raven Group is off today. Again, we have amazing sponsors that have been with us on this journey, more than 900 episodes. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Your Part-Time Controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. We have, we have so many ways you can get to us, Stephen, and get to all of our archives and all this information. You can download our super new sexy app, which I just love. Um, you can find us on podcasts, and of course, you can watch the broadcast. So my favorite thing, one of my favorite things is to take, if you have a smart TV, just take your remote and speak in and say the nonprofit show. And as Jarrett likes to say, we will join you on the sofa and you can watch us. Right? It really works. I've done it. It's amazing. Yeah, it's really, it's kind of scary to me. But yeah, I don't it, know how you did that. Yeah, so anyway, hey, okay, Stephen Shattuck, Director of Engagement, which is a great title for you because you, my friend, are very engaging. <laughs> so I just got to say. I try. Yeah, you know, you do a beautiful job. Capital Campaign Pro. Talk to us about what Capital Campaign Pro does. Yeah, we're we're a, a we're a consulting agency, so we help organizations. Um, we steward them through their capital campaigns from uh, the early planning stages to the feasibility process, and then on through uh, the solicitation and the public phase and all that good stuff. So, if you're considering uh, a capital campaign, uh, check us out because we got a great team of of coaches. We were talking about that, uh, Julia. That's the really the right word for it. We we help coach people through it. Um, and that's where we did this, this awesome research that, uh, we're going to talk about today too. So it's fun. <laughs> you are based in Indiana, which is such yeah. an interesting part of our country because it really has led, most people don't know this, but Indiana, um, has really led the nation and I would say the world, um, with a lot of nonprofit thought leadership, technology, yeah. management. I mean, the Eli Lilly School mm -hmm. um, at IU. I mean, say no Bloomerang's more. there. Shout out to your sponsor. Yeah. Yeah. Bloomerang's based there. I mean, Stephen Shattuck is based there. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. But um, do you work with folks throughout the nation? Yeah, absolutely. I think we have uh, every state covered at, at least once um, and, and some uh, Canadian nonprofits, too. We love our, our friends to the north. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Cool. Well, let's get into this research and and have you maybe first and foremost talk about how you started this. Let, let me let me let me back up. I want to know, like, <laughs> how you conducted the survey. Yeah why you conducted it and kind of give us the the dynamics and then we have some very specific questions about findings so yeah let's back up a little bit back well you, you you know me you know i've been on the show talking about the the donor retention research that we did at bloomerang and i know they've been back to talk about that you know and i do my my giving experiments so yeah. research is is always something i'm really interested in and and with capital campaigns there really was none. Um, there's there's a lot of good stuff out there for other disciplines of fundraising. You know, there's tons of research on online giving and donor retention, like I talked about. But capital campaigns, 
uh, you know, there's a lot of them happening uh, every single day and, and, you know, all year long and they last multiple years and big organizations are doing them. And they're, you know, usually very successful, but there wasn't sort of that underlying, you know, here's how most people approach them. Yeah. Um, here's what works. Here's what doesn't. Uh, and you know, you know how it is with fundraising. There's all kinds of advice and stories and anecdotes and all that is good. But we sort of observed that one sort of missing piece, you know, that one leg of the stool that was missing. Um, not even a, a whole leg, maybe just it was just a little wobbly, like you got to put a couple playing cards under it. So that's what we did with the <laughs> with the research. So we went out and and surveyed um, as many nonprofits as, as we could get to respond. Uh, and we had some great partners. So Bloomerang was one of them. They put that word out. That was awesome. Uh, others, iWave, Aspen Leadership Group. Uh, and you guys also gave us some shout outs on social media. So thank you for that. And basically, we asked people, are you in a capital campaign? Um, did you recently finish a capital campaign? Or are you thinking about one in the future? And if they fell into one of those three groups, we had uh, a specific survey for each of those three cohorts. And we got uh, to our... Uh, um, you know, uh, appreciation, a lot of responses in each. And we thought, well, why don't we publish this? So we asked people, hey, what's driving your campaign? You know, what's your goal? If you finished, how did it go? Um, lots of things with regards to, uh, you know, what were some of the benefits of doing the campaign besides just the dollars raised? You know, what role did the board and your CEO and ED play? Um, and then the the biggest thing, and we were talking about this before we hit record, Julia, but like, you know, the last three years, I think I have to say were pretty tough and 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 yeah. way different than maybe the last hundred years, right? Um, right? And we wanted to know, did that change the way people are thinking about capital campaigns? So all of that is available in the in the full report. Lots of really interesting things that surprised us, and some that didn't. But now we have sort of that concrete. Um, uh, research there on, on those aspects. So lots of cool things. You can get it from our website, just capital campaign dot, uh, capital campaign pro.com slash research. Right. And uh, you can dig into them yourself. Well, so let's, and thank you for, for kind of backing up the truck on that because sure. <laughs> I really was curious as to, you know, what this was looking like. And I think, as you know, I mean, the old fashioned garbage in garbage out, right surveys i mean you got to figure all this stuff out <laughs> and who you're who you're convening to get the this information and then how you navigate that forward so let's start off by saying by asking you are capital campaigns even successful given where in this marketplace and i use the word marketplace in the sense of historical like a historical marketplace you you said something fascinating you know, 100 years of capital campaigns, easy in this country. 100 years, easy. <laughs> Last three years, right? totally, totally different. So what is this right. like? Well, you know, this is a big endeavor, right? So I think this is um, a discipline of fundraising that carries with it a, a very specific type of nervousness. Like, okay, this mm -hmm. is going to be two, three years, yeah. you know, hundred million dollar goal or 10 million, you know, and for some organizations, a million dollar goal in a capital campaign is really big. Yeah. And, and it's like, well, if, if we fail, you know, will that be a huge disaster? Will that set us back? Will that be embarrassing? Um, so the, the real reason we asked this question was to, we crossed our fingers that most people said, yes, this would be successful so that we could sort of exert that confidence. Like, no, you can do it you know, most capital campaigns, if you really dedicate yourself and and follow the process, you know, whatever that process is, you'll be successful. And and that's what we found, even in the midst of COVID. And then, of course, this, you know, really tough economy we've been um, encountering over the past year or so, yeah. a vast majority of the people, 94% who had finished a campaign said that they considered it a success. So that was really great to see. And and upon reflection, I don't think I should have been so surprised because, you know, all other areas of giving, you know, in 2020 and 2021, even though we had a terrible pandemic and we're still in a pandemic in a lot of ways, yes. people respond generously. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be the case that capital campaigns were no exception. And maybe we're even better uh, equipped to sort of capitalize on that, that generosity because there's usually a very specific endeavor or project or building, uh, you know, a very specific need that people can point to. 
so not only were most of the people that we asked successful, um, but the average percentage of the goal raised was way over 100 percent. It was actually uh, 108 percent was the average that people said that they had raised of their original goal. So they exceeded it, um, which was great. And um, the, the real interesting about thing about this is we we sliced and diced the data by size of the organization. And small shops, which we defined as a million dollars or less in annual revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and that's just kind of an arbitrary, you know, mark that we found. Small shops sure. are great. You know, they're still awesome. Um, they were just as successful as sort of the rest of the field. So this is also an area where, you know, maybe there's a feeling, oh, we're too small. You know, that's that's for a big university. That's for a big healthcare system. Um, right. Not the case. Again, if you really follow through and dedicate yourself to it. There's really no reason why you can't be successful. Well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm loving this information because it gives me hope. It gives me yes. hope for the ecosystem of what's going on now and for what future decisions, different boards and, and fundraising arms of organizations are going to make mm -hmm. to go forward. So let's talk about this myth and it's the capital campaign cannibalization myth, because I am, I, I'm sure you sat on boards too, yes. where the, the word comes up capital campaign and everybody's like, no, no, we'll lose all of our, you know, our existing right. relationships and it'll, it'll take everything away. You're telling us, I mean, I think you're going to say something different because we have the word <laughs> myth in there. What does this look like? So this is by far the, the number one sort of objection. You're exactly right to doing a capital campaign. And, you know, <laughs> talking to the folks at, at Capital Campaign Pro that have been doing this for many, many years, even before the founding of, of the agency, this is always the number one thing. OK, we're thinking about a capital campaign, but, oh, a board member or, or you know, somebody in the development office or the ED, someone is like, well, we could do that, but what's the point if the annual fund just, you know, goes off a cliff mm -hmm. and then, you know, it nets out in the end after a few years. So we would always tell people, we haven't encountered that in our practice. And I know other capital campaign consultants say the same thing. So despite that, there's still this sort of nervousness. So this was actually one thing we wanted to either put to rest or say, okay, maybe this does happen, but here's what we want to do about it, right? But what we found was really interesting on this. So I mentioned before that there were multiple cohorts. So their first cohort right. was people that were just thinking about a campaign. So we didn't ask them that because they weren't in a campaign, obviously. But then the other two people in a campaign now, and then the third group, people who have finished. So mm -hmm. the people that are in a campaign, we asked them, okay, what has happened to your annual fund uh, during the campaign? And 79% of them said that the annual fund either increased or stayed the same. So only 21% said that it went down. So that was really great to see. And now there's a lot of reasons why your annual fund can suffer, right? Yeah, so, yeah, of you course. know, if, if you ignore it during a campaign, it's probably going to suffer. But there doesn't seem to really be any evidence that the capital campaign itself causes that cannibalization mm -hmm. and then for the third group people who have finished a campaign recently we asked them the same question so during the campaign so that was wrapped into the 79 percent. but then we asked the people who finished okay what has happened in the subsequent kind of post campaign years mm -hmm. and only nine percent of those people said that the annual fund is less than it was before they started the campaign. Yeah. So even in those subsequent years after the campaign, there doesn't seem to be this, this enormous drop off. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're listening to this and say, well, that happened to me. Okay. It did happen to some people for sure, but that's something you might want to work through. Like, okay, what was the Why? cause of that? Yeah. Was the, the sort of the, um, the eye taken off, um, you know, things in the annual yeah. fund there, but, this was something we were very happy to see and, and hopefully put the myth to rest um, mm -hmm. that it doesn't have to be that way. And in, in fact, most people don't experience that. You know, I think that's a uh, for capital campaigns that I've been involved with. Um, I think that's the success that comes with having that kitchen cabinet or outside people. I don't know if that's how you all yeah. 
coach or whatever, but it just seems to me that the message is being delivered differently by a bunch of community leaders who say, let's get on and push hard to the end on this one thing. And then you have, you know, your, your other teams going forward. But if you try and take one team and move it to this right. capital campaign, I, I think that's where we get the notion. It of doesn't work. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Let me ask you about this, Stephen, because this is one of those things that, um, I just got to believe in my gut that this happened, that people were geared up to start a capital campaign. And then this pandemic came. I mean, you and I over the years have talked about pandemics, from mm -hmm. civil unrest to social unrest, economic unrest, of course, you know, global a global health act. But um, how, how, what happened? Like, did people say we're going for it or did they like, oh, no, you know? What was actually occurring? Well, I, this may be surprising and hopefully won't disappoint you, but by and large, people didn't put their foot on the brakes for these big campaigns. Wow. And that's something that, you know, we saw at Bloomerang in the early days of the pandemic with so many people, exactly what you said, like, whoa, this is not a good time to ask. <laughs> yeah. This may be insensitive. But actually, it was the opposite. It was probably one of the best times in, in history. And I don't mean to be shrewd about that, yeah, yeah. but people needed help, right? Mm -hmm. And if you had a clear case for support, a clear need that you could articulate, and doing so with a sense of urgency, those are the people who won the last three years. And perhaps, you know, those people self-selected into our community and then answered the survey, but only 27% <laughs> of people delayed a capital campaign due to COVID specifically. And then as we were doing the research, it was really when this was starting to, the, the, the economic fears were starting to crank mm -hmm. up. So we added that and said, hey, you know, is this looming recession. I don't even know if it's going to be a recession. It seems like there's, it goes back and forth every day now, mm -hmm. but only 13% said that the economy was going to be something that, that delayed the campaign, which that really made me happy. Cause you know, and I know you have too, but you know, the last three years we've been shouting at the rooftops, like keep going. You, you have a case for support. You're a worthy cause. Yeah. Sure. People are hurting, but you know, sometimes that's when they're most generous themselves. Um, right. so that was great to see. So, um, yeah, That's it didn't amazing. seem to be a barrier to capital campaigns. You know, to me, when I hear that, it seems to me that that's like bold and visionary leadership. Yes. Because people saying, you know, like that didn't have the study to refer to. Right. Had something in their heart and their soul and their intellect that said, hell no, we're going forward on this. Yeah. And we're going to be bold. I think that's a really astute observation that I that I it hadn't occurred to me, but you know that bold leadership and vision is something that is also required for a capital campaign. Yeah. So it you know they're part and parcel. So it's good that those people you know we, we're going to build this hundred million dollar center because they're we got kids in need. They're not going to let you know um, the possibility of of a recession, which may not even happen now, stop them. So that was really good to see. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that's one of the beautiful things about the nonprofit sector is that, um, you know, we have conviction. Yes, we, we have conviction about things. And I think in the early days of the um, pandemic, you know, there was a clarion call to people that that were would stand up and say, if you think things are tough for our, our clients, or our communities, they just got a hell of a lot tougher. Right. So so don't pump the brakes because right. now we are needed more than ever. I don't care what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, some things are, you know, needed more than others, but we yeah. gotta we gotta buckle up and, and and really start looking at this. And so Absolutely. You know, and it's an it's an amazing thing to lived through this, but I love that you could that you all would study this. Mm -hmm. Because I think <laughs> You know, when you're in the middle and you're living it, it's like one thing. But then when you get the feedback yeah, and you start to really look at this, it's remarkable. And there will be something else. You know, it, it may be hyper localized, like, uh, you know, something happening to your city or town, a natural disaster. But there will always be something that you could use an, as an excuse to not move forward. But it all boils down to don't decide for your donors. They say no. 
fine, but at least you ask them. Right. Don't. Yeah. I love that, Stephen. I, I've heard you say that before <laughs> in other ways. And, and I love that. It comes up in every way, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. And I mean, it's, it's like one of those things. It's a truism that we need to keep <laughs> repeating. Um, hey, let's talk about feasibility studies. We don't have a lot of time left, but this is one of those things that I've never been involved in a capital campaign where this wasn't like a major part yeah. of the decision-making process and then ultimately forming the case for support. Right. Can you share with us what yeah. you learned? It is often there. You know, there are some people who skip it and there there can be good reasons, but but you know, I think after reading this research, there there were so many benefits that we identified to doing the feasibility study that kind of surprised us. So it actually the the this finding actually didn't come from a, a direct question. We we asked people um, in a campaign and and then post campaign people, what were some of the other benefits to doing the campaign besides the dollars raised? And we gave people kind of a menu and they could they could select which ones apply to them and we kind of ranked them. And so things like you know we have stronger relationships with our donors, our internal systems were improved. You know, our team members felt like it was, um, you know, learning for them and they felt like uh, it was kind of professional development is the term I was looking for there. So we got all those answers. And then I was kind of manipulating the data and I thought, I wonder if people answered those those benefit questions differently, depending on, you know, goal size. Did they do a feasibility study? And the feasibility study differences were really clear. So for example, this is just one example, but among people who did a feasibility study, 94% of those people said that the major ancillary benefit to the campaign was stronger major donor relationships. And that makes sense because those people are a big part of the feasibility study process, right? You're probably interviewing them. You're, yeah, you're talking to them. Talking. So that's a good relationship right. builder. Yeah, but people who didn't do a feasibility study, only 66% of them said that their major donor relationships were strengthened. So those, you know, by about almost a third, a big drop off there. So that was that was pretty interesting. So that alone is probably worth the, the time and effort and cost. You know, there is usually a cost involved for sure. But that that can have long tail benefits. Yeah for as long as that major donor is is with the organization right all the way through plan giving perhaps not to be too sure. morbid about it but you know that's good to have that relationship there and yeah. the other interesting thing everybody likes to know about the dollars but people who did a feasibility study 51 percent of them increased their goal they thought oh actually we can raise more right and you know most of them did as we said in the beginning um and that's a hair on fire moment for me yeah right <laughs> oh my god we that can do this me, that's fascinating that's yeah. fascinating so who doesn't want more money so over half the goal raised and only 18 percent did it lower which isn't necessarily a bad thing you know that could just be no. more of a realistic realistic yeah. yeah so so many good things there um but you know we're we're sort of uh, uh, uh we try to be impartial about it but you know people should do feasibility studies <laughs> i mean they're they're yeah. there's so much fun stuff that comes out of them yeah you know, that's riveting because I think a lot of times people say, well, I mean, I've, I've been in these meetings where people are like, <laughs> we don't need a feasibility study. We know what we need. We right. know our project. We know our donors and we know our community. Let's yeah. just get out there and start asking. Right. Versus saying, you know, what is the perception? How do we go yeah. about this? I mean, it's really an interesting thing because to me, it, it we we use the word feasibility study, but it's really market research. Yeah, it's I'm I'm the president of the let's rename the feasibility study like association. I, I, I'm joining. Okay, I'm joining. you're you're gonna be my VP, um, yeah. or I'll be your VP because you brought it up <laughs> first. That'd probably be better. But like we don't do ourselves. It's like plan giving. It's like. That's yeah. it's we should call it legacy because that's really you know, I, and there's other people talking about that and make that up yeah. but like yeah th these terms we don't do ourselves many good favors do we <laughs> no I mean it's it's so brutal and I think too um, it it makes it more of a transactional right 
I see that thermometer, you know, graphic where we fill in the, with the red yeah, ink on the billboard and, outside. Yeah. As we go up and it's like versus being a little bit more strategic and understanding, right. um, you know, how we can navigate this and how we can get our communities to to march along with us, because these are huge, huge, um, to use your word, legacy issues, because mm -hmm. capital campaigns are generally long term strategic um applications to yeah. how we serve right so i mean it's not just funding a big checking account necessarily right i think yeah. there's a part of that i mean especially sure. in the west we're trying to build endowments endowment yep because in, because the east and in in older parts of the midwest endowment has been part of a cultural norm yes absolutely. in the west it's not i mean we're still building infrastructure yes so it changes you know the dynamic but you know, I always, always, always love talking with you. Um, I think you're just one of the brilliant minds and it's Aww. really been fun to, you know, have you here with us yet again. Um, I've got to ask, are you going to be doing your giving uh, Tuesday? Well, I think th so. Uh, the folks at Bloomerang are still doing that and they're doing really interesting kind of variations on it. So if you don't follow Bloomerang, you got to follow them because they're awesome and they're always putting out good stuff. But um, I'm going to we're going to do this capital campaign research every year. And yeah. and you know me, I I may come on and, and surprise you with something that uh, is, is totally unrelated here uh, in terms of research, because I, I I love doing this stuff because it's so yeah. interesting to find those little nuggets but we're always good for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you, you bring us um, some new thoughts, new ways to look at things. I think um, you've helped us understand that we can become too emotional in, in thinking what we believe is to be true and right. not really understanding how to look at things differently. So yeah, uh, Jarrett and I are big fans of anything that's data driven and <laughs> research. So we invite you back on the Thank nonprofit you. show. It's been far too long. I know. Yeah. I'm glad we didn't get to a thousand, but you guys are going to be there pretty quick here. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, yeah. It's true. It's it's marching along with, with or without us, I have to say. Stephen Shattuck, Director of Engagement for Capital Campaign Pro. Check out Capital Campaign pro.com a lot of great information you can access this awesome research yep. and really help you to you and your organization to understand if this is an investment that you want to make um and then from there how you're going to make that investment in terms yeah. of time and talent and treasure it's a it's a heavy lift mm -hmm. but um shoot it's an exciting thing i i've been a, a part of a couple and wow it's stressful, but it's so it's worth impactful. it. <laughs> yeah, it really it really is. And it's um, one of those things that I think now that we are through um, this major disruption that we've had yeah. you know, across the planet in our in our own country, um, it's the discussion is going to start to bubble up. So if you're yep. part of a board or C-suite uh, leadership in a nonprofit, you're going to start to hear this discussion about capital campaigns more yep. and more. And so, um, yeah, look at the, look to our friends at Capital Campaign Pro to learn more about that. Again, Stephen, you know, we talk about you a lot. You are one of the very first people that we spoke to <laughs> at the dawn of the pandemic. And you were like, hey, you gals, I'll stand behind you. I'll keep going. Because I love it. Thanks. Since every day. It's amazing. I don't know how you do it every day, but I, I, every day on LinkedIn, it's like, oh, that's an amazing guest. And I'm, I'm listening yeah. while I'm thank you. making a sandwich or, or something. And it's, it's, I love it. <laughs> well, thank you. It's a big part you of my know, life. <laughs> thank you. It, it's a, it's sometimes a labor of love, but we learn something new every day and it's genuine. We have genuine interest um, when, <laughs> when you see us and how we talk. Um, it's, it's, it's very, very real. And um Again, thanks to our partners that, that make this, this possible. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, and nonprofit tech talk. They join us day in and day out. Um, it's a small community, but it's a mighty community of thought leaders, such as yourself, my friend, Stephen Shattuck. <laughs> I do recommend Robots Make Bad Fundraiser, <laughs> that book, all the time because it's, I think, a great read. And so um, check that out. I'm sure you can still find it on Amazon. Yep, correct? it's there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's <laughs> I have bought that book for so many people. Oh, I'm thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. It's really great, and it's uh, I think it's it's just a natural extension of who you are and how you look at our sector, and we are very fortunate to have you in our sector. So thank you, Stephen. Thanks. Chad. Hey, you know every um, every episode we still end with this sign off, and Stephen has heard this heard us say this before um, but it means something different all the time and especially this is a busy week for thanksgiving and for yeah. a lot of family stress and travel stress and so i even hear this message differently today as i speak it and it goes like this to stay well so you can do well happy thanksgiving my friend and we'll see you soon thanks see you guys bye